Well, first of all, let me thank the organizers for a chance to give this talk. And uh, thank you all for coming. So today I will be talking about the this recent work that appeared on the archive in January. And it was written together with Nimar Kani Ahmed, as well as Lawrence Eberhardt, who are both at the IES in Princeton, and Yutin Huang, who's in Taiwan. So the, the stock will be divided into three separate parts. Uh, and the uh, for in the first part, I will review a sort of a structure that I'm sure is very well uh, familiar to all the experts on string theory, but perhaps not familiar to not familiar to everyone working on double copy. And it has to do with this double double copy like factorization on all resonances in string theory. Okay, so recall that in string theory we have, we have an infinite tower of resonances, and they they are given by the uh, the, the masses squared are quantized in the units of one over alpha prime. So there's resonances at every integer. And now what we can do is we can take some uh, endpoint, say tree level amplitude in open string, and we can look at what happens close to this uh, maximal resonance. So uh, maximal resonance, I mean the maximal degeneration into trivalent diagrams. Of course, then we can uh, separate the color part of the corresponding to, to a given trivalent diagram, as well as the remaining thing, which is the numerator. The numerator, of course, depends on the graph, but also on all these uh, specific masses that flow um, uh, in that tree. And then a special thing that happens in a closed string is that in a closed string, you can once again look at the residue of that maximal resonance, or the maximal cut in this case, and uh, it factors into two factors, and each of them is that um, uh, of the open string. Okay, so we have this double copy like factorization on every massive resonance, and this is what I will re review first. Then, in the second part of the talk, we'll move to uh, considering unitarity constraints, and this will be specifically for four point amplitudes at tree level. Okay, so what, uh, what we'll be looking at is the uh, some S-channel resonances in which we exchange a given spin on the intermediate channel. Then we know that close to such a resonance, we have a, a propagator S minus M squared responsible for this resonance, as well as some partial wave expansion. So there's some partial wave expansion in terms of uh, the scattering angle and depends on the spin and in principle on the dimension. Okay. And then uh, the couplings to the, these trivalent couplings here and here, we can call them C. So this, for the identical external states, will correspond to some C, C squared coefficient. And the authority simply tells us this coefficient is supposed to be positive or zero. OK, uh, this is very easy to check in, in field theory amplitudes, but it turns out to be an extremely difficult uh, statement in string theory, because in string theory, we have an infinite number of resonances and infinite number of spins being, uh, being exchanged. Uh, so that means that uh, checking such a constraint is uh, enormously difficult. And what I will tell you about in the final part of this talk is an onshell proof of unitarity, which essentially proves the uh, positivity of those coefficients up to the space-time dimension uh, six. Okay, so let's start very easy with the uh, first part of the talk in which I will be talking about the entirety cuts for tree level strings. Okay, so what I wanted to explain in the, in the following two slides is that what we can do is we can translate the cuts, which in this case corresponds to setting some modest time invariance, say SIJ, um, to some integer and doing a residue uh, here on the kinematic space. Uh, of, of your uh, worksheet theory, which corresponds to a residue now on the worksheet uh, in terms of the positions of the punctures, say ZI and ZJ, of the corresponding resonance. So on such a residue, the usual cartoon picture of strings, um, the coupling into the left piece here and the right piece here, connected by a, a infinite throat, is going to be made precise in which you can think about this, this infinite throat as being essentially a word line or a Feynman diagram that exchanges uh, that, uh, this, this interaction. Okay, so first of all, let me quickly review the fact that computations in string perturbation theory are done on Euclidean worksheets. So in the traditional picture, in the say in the case of the closed string, we have the integration over the moduli space of Riemann surfaces with number, given number of handles and number of punctures. And then we have these correlation functions of vertex operators, which already exhibit this double copy-like factorization into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic left and right moving modes. 
Okay, so in the open string case, we have a similar uh, type of correlation function, which only has the holomorphic modes. In the closed string, we have the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. And in the open string case, we also have to uh, specify some specific integration contour, which I call the gamma in here. Okay, so one thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that because we formulate the perturbation theory in terms of uh, Riemann surfaces, they are sort of manifestly Euclidean uh, uh, manifolds. And, uh, but for many studying of many physical properties, we often care about uh, uh, the Lorentzian properties, such as especially uh, in entirety, in which there, there are, there's a notion which is specific to uh, Lorentzian spacetime. Okay, so there's this sort of intrinsic tension between formulating theory on the Euclidean manifolds, but then knowing secretly that it's supposed to be embedded in a Lorentzian target space. In fact, this is a source of huge issues in string perturbation theory. And uh, it's a topic that it's not often talked about in string theory textbooks, but is actually uh, related to the fact that we don't exactly know how to define the above integrals. Uh, more precisely speaking, uh, it's not known what precise integration contour we should choose for each of those integrals such that they converge in the, Euclid in the Lorentzian kinematics, okay? So for example, we cannot simply put them on a computer. We need to do much more work. So what, what I wanted to do in the next slides is illustrate this on the, on the simplest example of the Veneziano amplitude, okay? So the Veneziano amplitudes means we scatter four open strings. It depends on the Mandelstam invariance S and T, and it's given by the simple integral here over Z, and the physical interpretation of Z is the cross ratio of the uh, positions of the punctures, okay? Then we integrate uh, Z between zero and one in here, uh, which has two dangerous points, when z approaches zero and when z approaches one. Okay, I will be working in the mostly minus signature in which the uh, sine of s is positive, sine of t is negative, and I will also set the alpha prime constants to one throughout this talk. Okay, what this means, because s is positive, this factor here gives us a divergence as z approaches zero. Okay, so that's a dangerous point when, when in this integral, when z is at the bottom end of the integration. In fact, this is precisely where the S-channel poles come in string theory from the neighborhood of z uh, being very small. So what we can do at this stage is just do this change of variables from uh, z to this exponential uh, of minus tau. Okay, and then in, this, in the tau language, what we want to study is the behavior as tau goes to plus infinity. Okay, then you can just simply do this uh, basic change of variables. And what you find is that after you expand in terms of these, these exponentials, is that now we integrate from zero to infinity. And the first factor just simply looks like e to the tau s. Then we have, we have some corrections into e uh, with factors of e minus tau and e minus two tau and so on and so on. At this stage, you can simply integrate these contributions. And you can notice that this first integral is very simple to do. And in fact, it gives you the massless exchange of uh, one over S pole. Then the second contribution gives you a first mass level, S minus one, then S minus two, and so on and so on. So this is how you see the, the resonances in, in string theory. Let me emphasize that this is precisely the sort of concrete way of seeing the cartoon picture that, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, that we have some string wall sheet that corresponds to scattering of strings. And then we took this limit in which the uh, we develop this infinite tube that connects the particles one, two to those uh, of three and four. And you can, uh, the, the parameter tau that we introduced has the physical interpretation as the proper time elapsed along this infinite throat. So this is precisely what, why we needed uh, to go to, to, to infinity, because this is the, the word line limit in which the Riemann surface degenerates into a Feynman diagram. Okay, but importantly, we land on Euclidean word lines. Okay, so there's the subtle but important difference between uh, shrink a when we shrink a parameterize a propagator in the Euclidean space, we would do it using this integral here, where the interpretation of tau is that of the Euclidean proper time. Okay, and this is in contrast with the Lorentzian uh, signature uh, 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 proper time, which uh, here I called T sub L or tau sub L. Okay, and at least if you're careful about the, your I, I, I epsilons, 
the, the two transcriptions are actually related by the weak rotation of the word line, which uh, goes from Euclidean to, to Lorentzian, uh, which in this case, it's not an issue because in one dimension, word lines are already one dimensional. Uh, so that means that uh, the rotation should be easy. Okay, so now what we would like to do is we wanted to resolve the previous um, issue with non-convergence as Z was going to zero. And this corresponds to physically to integrating over Lorentzian worksheets, but only locally close to the divergence that we encountered. Okay, so recall that here, let's look at the left picture. The uh, divergence came from the region as tau was going to infinity. This was, the, this was where the resonances are. So what we would like to do is uh, integrate from zero up to some large number tau star, and then we rotate after that to uh, the Lorentzian contour. Okay, so we have Euclidean contour up to some large cutoff and then Lorentzian uh, going upwards. Okay, then we can ask what this corresponds to back in the original variables on the worksheet. So re recall that the change of variables was, uh, was uh, this one. Okay, and then what this means in the Z uh, uh, integration space is that we integrate this end here, zero maps to a one, and then there's the straight line that we just copied from before. But uh, for some large tau star, there's going to be some cutoff, some, some circle here, starting from which we start adding a phase to Z, okay? And then we add a phase which goes from zero all the way to I infinity, uh, or infinity rather. Okay, so what this means is that we encircle, start encircling the, the, this point in here, and actually we encircle it an infinite number of times. Okay, we wind around to this, uh, uh, z equals zero an infinite number of times. And now there's a, a small magic that happens, uh, which is that you can actually resum this infinity. Okay, and that, and that actually turns out to be very important. So let's notice that there was a branch cut extending from z equals zero, and actually there was a branch cut extending from z equals one as well. So this means that from the cir first circle was just simply this, this residue in here, then once we encircled it once, we go on a second sheet of, uh, of this logarithm in here, which means that we pick up an extra monodromy factor, okay? So from the second circle, we get this factor. And then from the third circle, once we encircle twice, we get twice the, or the monodromy factor squared, which is equal to this uh, factor of e to the minus four by i s, and so on and so on. Then at this stage, you can notice that this is precisely a geometric series in which the prefactors resum, but we keep the, the, this residue circle here. Okay, and they resum precisely to the, this factor in here. And one thing you can notice that's sort of uh, uh, playing well with our physical intuition that the string theory should have an infinite number of resonances. And the way that you see it at the technical level is that here, when S becomes an integer, you have uh, one minus one in the denominator. So this is precisely what gives you an, a resonance at, at integers. Okay, so at this stage, what we found is that the contour for the, um, for the Veneziano amplitude, which is here on the left-hand side, is uh, something that looks as follows. Uh, here we have this uh, residue um, around z equals zero with this prefactor, and I just inserted an additional minus sign because uh, this is actually this contour here it goes uh, clockwise, which is the minus residue. So there's another minus sign. Okay, and then from the rest of the integration in the bulk, we get this factor in here, and you can do a similar kind of analysis, uh, which doesn't matter in the S channel, but it could matter in the T channel. Um, uh, by compactifying the contour around z equals one as well, and this gives you t-channel poles. Okay, so this is the correct um, uh, contour for, for string theory. Um, and at this stage, you can notice that, well, all the singularities, all the resonances are already manifest because they're pulled outside of the integral. And now it's very easy to take cuts. Okay, taking cuts means that we take a residue here around S going to any integer N, okay? These, these, inter, this, uh, these residues just localize on these coefficients because this is the only source of, of poles in S as, as goes to N. 
And this means that we just select this prefactor, and that prefactor is the resu uh, run z equals zero. And this is the precise sense in which the sort of general story, illustrating the general story in which the uh, residues in the kinematic space translate to residues on the worksheet um, in, in this simple fashion. Okay, you can repeat the very similar uh, uh, logic for the closed string amplitudes. Already from what I said before, the closed string amplitudes fall, uh, holomorphically factorize into left moving and right moving or holomorphic and anti holomorphic modes. And you can repeat verse the almost identical logic. And what you would find is that doing a residue around um, S equals to N for the closed string at four point, uh, the, the result of that is some kinematic numerator, which factors into two pieces, the holomorphic part and the anti-holomorphic part. Each of them is given by a residue. Okay, so that we can recognize as, as uh, the guy from uh, above, and this is precisely what tells us that the uh, the residue for any massive resonance here, the closed string uh, answer is the square of that of the open string. Okay, now at this stage you can just go and repeat the same or very similar analysis, um, compactifying these contours at higher multiplicity, and uh, it sort of takes more bookkeeping, but Roughly speaking, philosophically, the, the procedure is, is very much the same. And the result that you find is the one that I flashed at the very beginning of this talk, which is that um, you can uh, focus on this maximal, res maximal resonance. So when you put exactly n minus three particles on shell uh, here, so you organize it, you can always organize it in terms of cubic diagrams. And then you have the Mandelstam invariants that go to some integers, which are the masses of the internal particles. Okay, and then in the open string, the generalization of the statement that we've seen at four point now at general multiplicity is that we'll have some numerator, which is given by the residue now on the worksheet. And uh, you can also decorate it with the color factors in the, in the usual way. Okay, and here the this numerator depends on the specific graph, but also on the specific assignment of the masses that uh, specific numbers for the masses that flow through every single edge of this diagram. Okay, and then similarly for the closed string, we have the factorization into on this on this on this resonance into left and right or n and n tilde, and this factorization. Uh, holds in any string theory, uh, bosonic, type one, type two, heterotic, and so on, just gives you different, uh, different numerators. Okay, let me perhaps emphasize, is, since this is a workshop on double copy, is that the numerators here do not have to satisfy kinematic Jacobian relations. So even though we can, on every single resonance, we, can, we have, this, we have the, this nice story, it does not mean that uh, different diagrams, the numerators for different diagrams are related in, in, in some specific way, except the, uh, if you look at the massless poles. The, it turns out that there's, a, there's an additional feature that happens at the massless poles in which, once again, you can, you can express each of these numerators as a residue, and then using a residue theorem, you can show that they are guaranteed to satisfy the kinematic Jacobi identities. Okay, but for the purposes of this talk, we wanted to ask, well, how can we use these facts to make statements about unitarity? Okay, so before I move to unitarity, are there any questions about uh, the first part of the talk? Okay, if not, then, then let me... Uh, sorry, actually, I, I had a question. <laughs> um, well, this statement you just made, so, so you're putting all the internal lines on shell. Yeah. So what does it mean to have the Jacobis? Because Jacobis relate the di different diagrams, which will have different internal lines on shell. Yeah. So, so, so it will not correspond to the same external uh, kinematics in principle, or, or will it? Uh... Yeah, so, so as I said, in the, at the masses level, you can, you can show that the, the diagrams for every triple, as, as usual, will satisfy the kinematic Jacobi identities. There might be some more complicated statement at, at this level, but it's not going to be as easy as a as a as a residue theorem. But I'm not making any claims here. Um, 
Okay, maybe I can ask it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so at this level, let's move on to tree level entirety. So um, entirety in string theory is something that is in principle guaranteed by the so-called Nogos theorem. Uh, but uh, so this has to do with the properties of the conformal field theory on the wall sheet. What we would like to do is prove it on shell, meaning from the amplitudes perspective. And there's actually, this is the reason, this is the way that um, historically this topic started. Uh, that people back in the 1970s wanted to prove the entirety of the Veneziano amplitude directly on shell. And then there were troubles with doing that. They couldn't quite do it. And uh, they eventually gave up when there was a different explanation using this so-called no ghost theorem. And what we'd like to do in this talk or in this work is we would like to revisit this old question and uh, see what we can do using uh, more modern philosophy. So let me first just explain what the entirety more concretely means at the level, uh, in the simplest case uh, of the external scalars. Okay, so for the, for the external scalars, um, uh, let's say they couple, they exchange some massive uh, uh, particle in the middle with some concrete spin J. This means that on the resonance, we can expand it in terms of the so-called Gegenbauer polynomials. So Gegenbauer polynomials are just d-dimensional generalization of the partial waves or of the Legendre polynomials in four dimensions. Okay, they de depend on the scattering angle, which I called uh, theta, or more concretely, they depend only on the cosine of the scattering angle. Okay, and now because precisely these, these spinning particles coupled to the, to the external states for these two vertices, we have some coupling uh, which is squared uh, when, once we assume that the external states are identical. It's just the fact that they're the same, uh, the, the same coupling. And the entirety at this level tells us that we need to prove that this, this prefactor here is positive, or perhaps it's zero if a given exchange does not exist. Okay, so this uh, turns out to be a very difficult task in string theory, and this is precisely because now we don't exchange a single spin and single mass, we have an infinite towers. Um, so the statement at this level is that what we would like to do is take a residue or entirety cut as S goes to N, uh, say for the Veneziano amplitude, and here N could be any integer. Okay. And then on that residue, we can expand uh, our answer in terms of the Gegenbauer expansion or the partial wave expansion. And then we can look at its coefficients. In entirety would tell us that all of those coefficients have to be non-negative, like so. Okay, so let's, to, to make this more uh, tangible at first, let's verify this at low mass levels in, say, in the boson, the simplest case of the bosonic string. Okay, so the bosonic string amplitude just integrates to this um, combination of the gamma functions. And after you perform the residue, it's very easy to, to expand it. And it's just this polynomial in T, the, the uh, momentum transfer squared. Okay, and then the momentum transfer squared is uh, very simply related to the uh, uh, cosine of the scattering angle. And from now on, I will be using this notation in which the cosine, which is the argument of the Gegenbauer polynomials, I will just call it x. Okay, so at this level, the um, uh, this polynomial is just some simple polynomial in x with some specific coefficients that enter in here. Okay, so then what we'd like to do is just take this polynomial and start expanding it in, in gegenbauers. Okay, so at low levels, um, first of all, the bosonic string of course has a tachyon at the level minus one. This means that this polynomial after you work it out is a constant, so let's say one. Okay, and one is just the simplest instance of the, um, the S wave, the, the spin zero um, uh, gegenbauer polynomials, okay? So that was very easy. Now we can look at the masses level. At the masses level, this formula here will tell you that uh, the right-hand side is equal to x. And once again, x is the simplest instance of the uh, spin one Gegenbauer polynomial. But now fun begins at the first massive level. At the first massive level, we have this polynomial in here, which is uh, x minus a fifth times x plus a fifth. Okay, so now it's, now it's interesting because we start seeing a quadratic term. 
a quadratic term it is um, sensitive to the spin two gegenmarer polynomial. If you just look it up on Wikipedia or something, you would find that it's equal to this combination. Okay, so now it's a less trivial task to expand this in terms of some linear combination of G2, G1, and G0. And it turns out it's you, you can do it with this with this combination here uniquely. Okay, and now we see an um, interesting feature. Of course, the coefficient of the G2 of the spin two is uh, one, but the coefficient of the scalar is actually depending on the space and dimension. Okay, and then we wanted to impose that this coefficient is positive for zero, and this imposes something the upper bound on the space time dimension, which in this, this case turns out to be 26. Okay, so this is um, this 26 is the famous critical dimension in boson extreme theory, and here we see it simply at the level at the level of uh, Venetian amplitude and studying unitarity of that of that amplitude. Okay, but of course we're not done yet. We have in fact an infinite amount of work left. There's a dot the dot because you need to check this at higher and higher orders and make sure that you don't have a constraint which is more stringent than than this one. Okay, so let's let me sort of illustrate the non-triviality of this task or the the level of a uh, of a diagram. Okay, so this diagram here on the y-axis is illustrating the coefficient of the Gegenbauer expansion, say in the four space-time dimensions, and then as we look at the mass level 100, okay, so that we are exchanging m squared equals 100 uh, over alpha prime uh, level, and this depends on the spin j. So on the on the x-axis here, I'm plotting the given spins. So there's a couple of features that we would like to emphasize at this level. So the first one is that the all the uh, every other spin, every other coefficient rather here is exactly zero. So more generally, what happens is that whenever the combination of n plus j, the level plus the spin, is the is even, then the corresponding coefficient vanish. In fact, we've seen this. If I may scroll uh, up to here, we've seen this feature already at the level of the uh, level one, in which the spin one was absent at the first mass level. And also spin zero was absent here at the zero class level. Okay, and this trend continues. Uh, okay, so then another feature that you can notice is this peak. So the coefficients become the strongest around um, the spin becoming roughly speaking twice the square root of n. And this, this, the, the position of the peak roughly coincides with the, uh, uh, where the uh, spectrum of the bosonic string becomes the most degenerate. Okay, so roughly you have the most states around this peak. Okay, but the most important part of this of this diagram is in fact in here. Okay, in here you have uh, coefficients that seem to die off very fast, and in fact there are huge cancellations between between different terms. So you have you have terms that cancel out, but they somehow conspire to still uh, give you a positive coefficient. So you can check that even though these uh, all these coefficients here are tiny, tiny, each of them are either uh, positive or exactly zero. So the non-trivial part of this track is that precisely how to deal with these cancellations and how to uh, understand that even though uh, you have them, you, the final answer always conspires to be positive. Okay, and of course, I'm obliged to say that this um, uh, seems to be extremely difficult in general. Okay, so now we've discussed briefly in the case of the bosonic string. Now let me mention equally briefly the case of the uh, super strings. Okay, in the case of the super strings, we have the super the, the analog of the Venetian amplitude, which just has a different gamma functions. And it also has this importantly this prefactor f to the four. F to the four is just the same as um, uh, the numerator in the pure young mills theory, and is simply this combination of the um, of the field strengths or the momenta and all the all the polarization vectors of the of the external particles. Okay, here at this stage the uh, task becomes more non-trivial because we no longer can expand things in terms of scalar gegenbauer polynomials. We have to have these spinning ones. 
So let me illustrate this at the first massive level. At the first massive level, the um, f to the four, this, this, this coefficient here, uh, can be expanded in terms of the spinning um, um, gigabar polynomials in, in, with some specific uh, representations. So there's a scalar representation, there's this uh, symmetric tensor representation, and the anti-symmetric uh, uh, freeform representation as well. And you can notice the coefficient of the last, la the latter two, is equal to one. And the coefficient of the first one, once again, depends on the space-time dimension. And in fact, requiring that it's positive or zero implies that the space-time dimension has to be at most 10. Okay, so let me perhaps explain this a little bit, mostly to the experts on, on string theory, that this, this is precisely expected. This is what you expect from the spectrum of string theory, in which you have the um, um, you, you have this uh, symmetric tensor configuration, you also have the anti-symmetric freeform uh, state. And in principle, the scalar uh, is absent from the spectrum. And this is precisely what happens in the ordinal superstring when, when you're in 10 dimensions, this coefficient here is zero, this is the same, same state statement. But you can obtain it by compactifications. And this is why this coefficient can become positive uh, when the space-time dimension is less than 10. Okay, so the long story short is that uh, it's enough to study positivity of the scalar gigabars, and they by themselves guarantee the expansion of the uh, spinning gigabars, provided that the space-time dimension is at most 10. Of course, this that by no means mean, means that we're done. We still have to check the scalar expansion and prove that that itself is unitary uh, on its own. Okay, and then finally, let me mention the case of the closed uh, strings. Okay, we could discuss um, once again any type of string theory, but let me let me focus on the superstring in type two. Okay, in this case, the um, the scattering amplitude at four point is given by this combination of the ratios of gamma functions as well as the prefactor, which is some uh, the square of that in uh, in the open case. And now we can use this fact that we we've seen at the beginning. the The fact was that on each massive residue, the closed string uh, it can be written as the residue of the open string all squared. Okay, or more generally, as a as a product of two um, uh, open string uh, amplitudes uh, residues. Okay, so at this level, we know that we can expand this uh, this argument of the of the square in terms of the gigabowers, but we're not done yet because we need to uh, ex further expand that answer in terms of the gigabower expansion uh, on its own as a linear function. But here we're rescued by essentially by representation theory. So representation theory, of course, tells us that if we have the some spin j and spin j prime representation, their product is expandable as a positive um, uh, sum over SOD minus one e reps. Okay, so this is uh, this represent representation theory. But physically, what it tells us is that the once you prove that the open string amplitude is uh, unitary, then double copy implies that the, also the closed string is unitary. In fact, something more, much more, str much stronger is true. What, the, what turns out to be true is that because the closed string is a square here, it is in a sense more positive than it needs to be. So it can be positive even when the open string is not. So in other words, it, the, this um, positivity check is less constraining uh, than in open strings. In fact, if you check this for the Verzorshop PR amplitude, one of the ones that we've seen above, it seems to be unitary all the way up to the di space time dimension 72. And I'm saying seems because this comes once again from checks at the low mass levels and it has not been proven all the way uh, uh, up to this dimension. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the final part and perhaps before that, there's any question. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, can I can I ask something? Yeah. So quick. So if if I if I, you want to do the same thing for higher points, is that uh, so? You, I assume they're going to be a KLT kernel appearing. 
somewhere within the squaring. Is it gonna affect anything or not? Or so so let me let me perhaps scroll to this. Um, uh, now it depends what we what do you want to check. You can check either interactivity for the single exchange, or you can check interactivity for the uh, exchanging two uh, simultaneous uh, uh, like the res twice the residue or a single residue. In neither of those cases has been considered. Even in the field theory, it's difficult to study interactivity at this level. In fact, it might not be necessary. Uh, but but roughly speaking, uh, because of this structure here, of the fact that the on the maximal residue. So once you take n minus three poles, so maximally that generate things into trivalent diagrams, then the, the coefficient of the closed string is the square of that of the open string and there's no additional KLT kernels, that, that's it. If you do, if you did the resonance of a, let's say at five point, <laughs> not a double resonance, but a single resonance, then you might have some additional KLT like factors. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. So with that, we can move to the final part of the talk, which has to do with the uh, direct proof of entirety up to the dimension six. So, uh, recall that the, the trouble with that was to actually prove that it's true at any mass level at any spin, which has, is, puts an infinite number of constraints. So it's typically very difficult to track them. Okay, so the... Um, uh, at, at this level, I'm going to skip the derivation, just flash you the final formula. What we found is that you can express the uh, these Gickenbauer coefficients. So these are the guys that are supposed to be positive or zero as the following double residue uh, expression. And I should emphasize that it's not entirely clear. We can derive it. It's not entirely clear what is the physical origin of this expression. And we're still uh, trying to understand it. But let me, we can use it as a tool for proving neutrality nevertheless. So let me, let me mention uh, how it looks like. Well, first of all, it has the, it, it's a double residue formula. So it has two variables, I call them tau and v. And then we take the residue as tau goes to zero and v goes to zero. And then here in the integrand, you have this combination that depends on the spin j or the space time dimension d and the mass level n. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, the we don't fully understand where, what, how we're supposed to interpret this formula, why it exists, uh, but at least you can interpret the tau variable here. This is almost exactly the same tau that we've seen above, roughly speaking, the word line length. Okay, it related to the z variable with this uh, change of variables. So localizing on tau going to zero is the same as z going to zero. And this is precisely the, this part is the physical interpretation of that is that of the entirety cut, which of course we needed to do to extract the, the, uh, the residue in the first place. But the origin of the V residue is more involved. So I, I can explain details later on, I, I will refer you to the, to the paper. Okay, but let me notice that there's this, uh, even though we don't, um, have a control of the physical meaning of this V, there seems to be this interesting tau and V symmetry uh, of, the, of this formula. In fact, what we can view it uh, as, we can view it as a generating function for the Gegenbauer coefficients here. So you can just think of expanding the, this, uh, this integrand in here, and then just picking up coefficients with different powers um, uh, according to the spin and according to the mass level, and this will give, just give you a generating function of different gain bar coefficients. And the statement at this level is that we wanted to prove that each of them are positive. Okay, we've already excluded, we, since we already understand that n plus j is uh, being even, it gives us zero coefficients, we don't have to worry about those. Okay, so what we do, uh, the, as the first step is this simple change of variables in which we trade tau and v for these uh, logarithmic variables x and y. Okay, at this level, the um, doing residue around tau goes to zero and v goes to zero is the same as x and y going to zero. So you have just this integration. And then the above uh, formula factors into three pieces. Okay, we have this piece here that depends only on the space time dimension. We have this piece here that depends only on the spin, and we have this piece that depends on the 
mass level and the spin as well. Okay, and, and once you've brought your formula to this uh, to this form, you can notice a, uh, a surprising thing that each of those factors has a positive Taylor expansion uh, up to dimension uh, six. Okay, so this is of course a huge overkill. We're proving way too much positivity than necessary, but that's of course guarantees integrity nevertheless um, up to up to dimension six. So roughly speaking, I'm just going to flash you what kind of arguments go into that. So basically you can take each of these three expansion, each of these three terms, this one, this one, and this one, and just expand it as X and Y go to zero in a Taylor series. And these factors going like that, just expand in terms, uh, um, in terms of these kind of polynomials. And th this is where the most stringent constraint on the dimension comes from, uh, from this X squared coefficient in here. Okay, and then you can prove it's not so difficult to show that all the remaining coefficients will be less constraining on the space time dimension. Okay, and then the second factor just involves uh, Taylor expanding this kind of function, which behaves like one over xy, and there, there's some uh, polynomial corrections, once again with positive coefficients. And then finally, in the, in the uh, final expression, this is actually extremely easy. This is just, you can apply the binomial expansion uh, and you will find that these coefficients are positive as well. Okay. So um, let me emphasize once again, that this is way too much positivity than is necessary for actual integrity, but we can do it for all masses and all spins up to dimension six. And it still remains a challenge to do it at the uh, dimensions all the way up to 10 uh, to all, all masses. Okay, you can repeat a similar formula. You, you can repeat a similar derivation. You arrive at this very similar formula for bosonic strings, in which case the positivity is manifest up to dimension 10. And of course, it's, it's also positive at the low mass levels up to 26, even though we, we don't know how to prove it at the higher mass levels. Okay, so then as, as, the, final, in the, as the final slide, let me um, also mentioned that the double contour representation could be used to study different limits of these uh, of these coefficients. So, for example, if we looked at the the curve that we've seen before with these two slopes, um, the first one was the um, what happens when you take um, j fixed and n very large. So it gives you roughly speaking this slope on on the previous diagram, and you can show that the, in the case with this power law behavior. Um, and the, the logs of n as well. And then you can also study separately the Reggie limit in which you expand around uh, uh, both n and j becoming very large, but you keep this ratio uh, n minus j fixed. Okay, so that's roughly speaking, um, looking at this part of, this, um, uh, of the curve. And then you see from that that um, the answer is actually now uh, exponentially suppressed. In fact, it's, it's this funny ratio of E, the Euler constant to four, uh, which happens to be less than one, and that um, the, um, the coefficients decay at large n with this, with this parallel. Okay, so perhaps before wrapping up the, the talk, let me just go through the slides and just recap what we've learned. So first of all, we studied these um, uh, residues of the uh, tree level amplitudes, we, in which I argued that the residues in the kinematic space translates into residues in the, uh, on the Riemann surface. Okay, and then I highlighted the problems that come with uh, integration of uh, string amplitudes that have to do with the fact that we make a formulation in the Euclidean space, but we compute things in the Lorentzian target space. Okay, and then we looked at the specific case of the Veneziano amplitude, which had the divergence as z was going to zero which was responsible for the S-channel uh, exchanges. Okay, then we managed to argue that by introducing this parameter tau that it uh, corresponds to this degeneration of the, of the worksheet. And uh, the curing the divergence had to do with analytic continuation between signatures, between the Euclidean and Lorentzian signatures close to these degenerations. Okay, and then I reviewed this, this result of Witten that the correct integration contour for the um, uh, closed string includes this, uh, for the open string includes this winding uh, around z equals zero. Then the resumming this kind of contours gave us precise handle on the 
um, on the resonances in uh, SS was going to any of the integers. And then we use that to prove not only that the residue becomes uh, in the external space becomes the residue on the worksheet, but also that there's this double copy um, uh, factorization for between closed string, uh, its residue becoming the square of that of the open string. Okay, and then I mentioned that this story generalizes to higher multiplicity uh, in which we have this factorization for every trivalent diagram and for every set of masses that flow through them. Okay, then finally, we talked we talked about the entirety and the entirety had to do with the Gegenbauer expansion, which uh, at the level of string theory became a difficult task because it involved an infinite number of spins and masses. Okay, so it um, boiled down to proving positivity of certain um, Gegenbauer coefficients. Okay, then we did this uh, explicitly in the bosonic string in which we found at the low mass levels, the constraint of the space-time dimension being 26. Then we, uh, I talked about the superstring case in which we found that just expanding the spinning Gegenbauer's in a, in a scalar basis was giving us uh, the constraint of the dimension, which was even stronger, that of D being up to 10. Okay, and then I mentioned the, this uh, cool fact about double copy. The double copy implied that the entirety of the open strings directly translate implies the entirety of the closed strings. In fact, it's a slightly weaker statement in which the closed string could be more positive, more unitary in a sense uh, than the open string. Okay, and then finally, I flashed this uh, uh, curious double residue expression that directly computes the uh, coefficients of the Gigabauer expansion and proving the entirety boiled down to proving properties of this double residue functions. And then we've seen that expanding it directly as a Taylor series, you can prove up to D equals six that the uh, um, uh, superstring theory is unitary at all, uh, all resonances. Okay, so with that, let me thank you for your attention and ask for any, any other questions. Thank you very much for your um, excellent talk. Right. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, Ricardo. Hi, thank you. Um, so you, you described this contour for the open string, uh, what is it now with the story in the closed string? Uh, is it just straightforward from that? Yeah, so it depends, uh, depends which part of the contour you're interested in. If we're just interested in the neighborhood of the, of the uh, close to the divisor, then on that, the, the contour locally looks like, so in the language in which I call the contour locally close to resonance being a residue on the open string, then it's just a product of two residues in the holomorphic and anti part. Mm -hmm. And then you might worry that there's a problem with the branches and stuff like that. But in fact, there isn't because the same as um, the open string case, because we already sit at the resonance, S here is an integer. So there are no branch cuts running through. Here. So residue is well-defined. The generalization of this story to closed string is that, um, yeah, locally close to the divisor, things are just products of circles. And at higher multiplicity, they're just products of, of n minus three holomorphic circles and n minus three anti holomorphic circles. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, Puria. Uh, yes, uh, thanks again for the talk. Uh, just at the end, when you discuss the limits, is it, uh, so any call n goes to infinity, is it the same as if I do alpha prime to, to, to zero? Or is it different? Uh, it's, but then uh, putting the masses to infinity, right? Yeah, it's. No, it's in principle different, yes. So in this case, uh, the the alpha prime sort of decouples from the problem because once we, um, uh, sorry, can you think about this? Yeah, yeah, because at that stage, you're only talking about the scattering angle. Scattering angle is roughly speaking like the ratio of uh, S and T. And at that <laughs> stage, the alpha prime actually decouples from the yeah. problem. So here we're mostly exploring the, yeah, 
more and more and more massive modes. And I, as I said, you can in fact do it in two different ways. One is keeping the fixed, uh, sorry, spin fixed, or you can keep the Reggie trajectory fixed. So this ratio of n minus j. Uh, it's a good question. Thanks. Right. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question. In the double uh, residue um, representation of Gickenbauer coefficient, uh, you explain the meaning of the tau variable. What is the, the physical meaning of uh, the other variable? Yeah, that's that's precisely what we don't understand. So um, I guess the most intuition from that would be looking at the der derivation of this formula. The derivation of this formula, we use some tricks to express the um, the so-called Rodriguez formula for the gigantic polynomials. There's some specific representation of these gigantic polynomials. It turns out that it can be traded for a certain residue. So we introduce this v as an auxiliary variable, and then at the end you can just notice that wow, there's there's this symmetry that between v that the formula turns out to look very symmetric. So that makes me that makes us think that there must be another way of deriving this formula and that gives you more illuminated, uh, uh, gives you some physical interpretation in a more illuminating way, but right now we don't understand exactly what's the, so it's an auxiliary, at this level B is an auxiliary variable. I see, thank you. So, um, any other questions from the audience? Um, yeah, let me ask us one naive question. So now that uh, we have a direct um, proof of uh, in entirety of um, string amplitudes, um, is it uh, from not from this um, more, new more modern vantage point? Is that can you see how it relates to um, the no ghost theorem? Uh, no, we 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 cannot. The statement of no ghost theorem is that there's no negative uh, uh, norm states in in your theory. So it, it is a direct. Um, in direct analogy with this, uh, the statement that there's no, you know, couplings with negative norms and so on. Um, but yeah, we 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 don't understand. Uh, I mean, it's difficult to make the relation between the two because one is like a CFT statement and the other is an amplitude statement that doesn't. In principle, you can study amplitude without knowing that it came from from a CFT. And. Um, um, and if you're working directly with the amplitudes, um, do you see any avenues for um, constructing new kinds of unitary string theories that we couldn't from from the traditional CFT? Techniques? Yes, that, that that was that was the in fact the main motivation for starting this project. It is for my collaborator around five or six years ago. Uh, uh, Nimark and Yamet proposed that this would be an avenue. Just putting these constraints, you might hope that perhaps there is only one solution to these constraints which would be the, the string theory. Now we know that there are certain tiny exceptions or tiny modifications of the, the same reservoir per amplitude that, that you can use to, uh, that are still unitary. Uh, so in a sense, it's not um, the hope perhaps was, was a bit, um, um, uh, didn't turn out to be true, but we can still use these kind of, um, uh, constraints to ask, for example, what is the generalization of this double residue formula? Are there other modifications of that that give us consistent amplitudes which are unitary at the same time? But yeah, that, that was to, to summarize, that was more or less the motivation to study is it is the is the Veneziano amplitude a unique answer satisfying all these infinite number of constraints, you know. Yeah. 